Uh, so to my immediate left uh, is Graham Brookie, the director and managing editor at the Digital Forensic Lab at the Atlantic Council. And then we have Rob Ferris, the research director at the Berkman Klein Center and co-author of the book, Network Propaganda. And then we have Ellery Roberts Biddle, advocacy director at Global Voices. Uh, so I think that they will do a great job of telling you about themselves better than I could. So I've asked them each to say a few words. Who goes first? <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Graham Brookie. Uh, I'm the director and managing editor of the Digital Forensic Research Lab at the Atlantic Council, uh, which is a traditional foreign policy think tank here in DC. Uh, a little bit about our work. Uh, we try to not be as uh, traditional think tanky as humanly possible. Uh, that means we're generally a bunch of millennials sitting at uh, our computers. And the kind of perception of what we do is that we're wearing a bunch of hoodies and looking at disinformation online. Uh, what we actually do is a few things. So we're set up to identify, expose, and explain disinformation with an emphasis on explaining disinformation. Uh, the way that we do that is exclusively using open source research. So when we publish, when we identify and expose something, we try to explain it by saying, okay, here is the beginning, middle, and end of this story. Here are the characters that are involved. Here are the tactics that were used. Uh, and here's whether it mattered or not, whether they reached an audience. And the way that we do that is by only using sources that you can access on your phone. Uh, the reason for that is because we don't want to assume our own credibility, uh, which is a major kind of piece of what we're talking about today. Um, the reason why we do any of this, the reason why we've set up this team, which is now, uh, over the last year, we covered 12 uh, elections on four different continents, uh, as well as security events like the conflict in eastern Ukraine or in Syria, uh, is to promote objective fact as a foundation for government and by people. That's our North Star. The second piece is to adapt for impact, because a lot of the conversations around this topic haven't really driven to an audience where it actually is engaging on information. Uh, and the third piece is what we're calling digital resilience. So. It, just in terms of two trends that cannot be reversed and should not be reversed, humans have more access to information than any point in history. Humans are also connected, more connected than any point in history. Those are generally pretty good things in our opinion, uh, but they have caused some unintended uh, consequences or externalities. And so how do we manage those things and create more resilience in this space is something that we're uh, extremely focused on. But that's the short version and I'll pass it over. Uh, hi, everyone. Rob Farris from the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Uh, thank you so much for braving the weather and sticking around with us now. Um, the Berkman Klein Center has been studying the Internet and Society for about 20 years now. We're a multidisciplinary center. We have lawyers, technologists, social scientists like myself. What I bring to this panel today is a large body of empirical work to understand political discourse online over the past decade, we've developed a platform we call Media Cloud, which is a little cutesy now, um, which is used to study and map digital uh, media. And um, as Liz mentioned, we have a book out. It's available for free download if you want to take a peek at it. Um, it covers U.S. political discourse around the U.S. election. Uh, based upon millions of stories, we uh, mapped partisanship, polarization, and a lot of dysfunction in media and political spheres over the course of the election and the time since then. Um, the takeaway lesson from all of this is we certainly we see lots of polarization and partisanship um, that technology plays a role in that, but technology is not the principal culprit in disinformation and misinformation online, that the roots of that will go much, much deeper. They're the function of decades of social and political processes that have led to the polarization and partisanship that we're seeing now. Happy to talk more about that, but let me leave it at that now. That's a good setup. Um, my name is Ellery, and I'm the advocacy director at Global Voices. Global Voices is a media organization. Um, but we're community-based, and we're completely international. So very few of us are here in the US. Um, our, we're a community of writers, translators, researchers, activists, and we have people in 176 countries. So we're spread really far. And as 
m I'm sure most of you know, um, getting a, a having a robust independent media that gives you lots of different information that's really, uh, you know, scrutinized and accurate and being able to find lots of different viewpoints out there is really difficult in many parts of the world and it gets harder when you have, um, when you live in a country where the media is either controlled or funded by the state, um, where media regulation is pretty heavy or where there are um, outright threats, whether legal, physical, or digital, against media workers. Um, these are all issues that have brought our community together as a place where people can do independent media work, um, hopefully safely, in one global platform. But it, they're also issues that we write about quite a lot. So I guess I'm kind of coming to this session from the, a, a really broad viewpoint of disinformation is, it's part of like public life and it's not new. I know that it has freaked everybody out in the US um, over the past couple years, but I think that there's, there's a great deal to learn from other parts of the world and experiences where there's quite a bit of institutional knowledge about um, how to face and handle these things. So I'll try to throw some examples of that out and see what we learn from each other. So that is actually a, uh, a perfect setup for, for my first question, uh, which I will toss to you first, Ellery. Uh, as you mentioned, a lot of the framing um, around, around these issues has really kind of um, suggested that this is a unique ph phenomenon of this particular place or this particular time, um, you know, the internet, the United States. Uh, but your work at Global Voices, you've been tracking disinformation campaigns, uh, questions around trust, attempts to uh, undermine democracy for a long time and know that this extends beyond the US and beyond the 2016 elections. Could you do a bit of a, a level set for us and tell us a bit more about um, kind of what's going on in this space and what has been going on? <laughs> sure, um, well, so there's one story that the, the blurb for this panel, at some, somewhere in the blurb it says, you know, trust is at an all time low. Is it the internet's fault? Um, and, it, and it was funny because it reminded me of a story that I, that I worked on with our Brazil editor in 2014. Um, and the story was about a small seaside city, uh, Guarujá, where there's not a strong media. Um, and like in many parts of the world, you know, people will form a Facebook group where you basically post and share information about what's happening. It's a way to know what's going on, right? So in this group with, that had 24,000 followers, um, somebody posted an alert about a kidnapping. And in the alert, they included a sketch of a woman who they believed to be the, the kidnapper. Another person saw the sketch and said, this looks like this woman that I've seen, and posted a picture of a, of a woman who lived nearby. And that escalated to a mob of people going after this woman, and they killed her. Um, she's the mother of two small children. She had not kidnapped a child. And in the aftermath of this awful event, um, there were a number of people who were arrested at, um, for perpetrating violence against this person. And then, and then there was a sort of little protest around those arrests that took place outside of the police station. And, the, and this group of people were chanting, it's everyone's fault, it's no one's fault, it's the internet's fault. And it gives you a sense of this public kind of just chaos, panic, uncertainty about who to believe and about what even makes these things happen. But there are, it's like, okay, we know that law enforcement is not reliable there because nobody engaged law enforcement, right? And when I, I sometimes will ask our contributors, like, why didn't you call the police? They're like, are you crazy? <laughs> I don't ask that question in such a naive way anymore. Um, but so it's that, you know, it's, it's, the, a lack of a reliable source of information, um, people not feeling like justice would be carried out, but that they needed to take it into their own hands. When governments and political parties enter the picture, um, you still have these kinds of groups where people are trying to, people want to know what's happening. Um, but social media is a great space, it's very uh, manipulable, and I do something that I think is newer is probably since the Arab uprisings, um, governments have gotten a lot better at figuring out, governments and political parties, 
have gotten a lot better at figuring out how to manipulate online spaces to their advantage. Um, and that comes in the form of you know, promoting ideas and people that work in their favor, of condemning um, ideas and groups that, that they don't like, and generally surveilling the public. Um, so those are all issues that we've seen play out in a lot of different places, and I think there's bits of that really coming up in the U.S. and scaring everybody. So it's interesting. Rob, I want to ask you um, about your book because it also touches on maybe some misconceptions or assumptions, um, and particularly your thesis. Would you mind kind of sharing that with us and telling us a bit about um, your, your thesis, but also a bit more about the methodology? Uh, sure, sure. So uh, a ton of research, it's, a, it's at the core an empirical work, and what we did is we mapped media ecosystems. and. What we expected to find going into this study is um, kind of hyper-partisan disinformation coming from both sides. Um, as you move to the center a little bit more, honesty in media, perhaps some bias, but in the middle you have this kind of this marketplace of ideas that's figuring out what the truth is or not. So, I mean, first of all, we found out that uh, things were very polarized, no surprise there. The second part of this that surprised us is that the polarization was not equal on either side. We kind of expected, and I think a lot of us understand the world to be one of symmetric two sides going at one another. Uh, that's not the world we live in. Um, conservative media is more insular, it's more extreme, and it's more partisan. And uh, that's probably not a happy message for a lot of people. Um, but it's an empirical observation, not a subjective opinion. Um, that explains a lot of what we see in politics. It also explains away a lot of convenient solutions to what we see as the current epistemic crisis. Um, we would like to blame it on technology. Uh, it's hard to take that technology being the root cause of disinformation seriously if things are more rife on one side than the other. It kind of dispels with that. So uh, what we do in the book is we tell a very, very long story with a lot of detailed data explaining how we got to where we are today. And it's a many decades long story and it involves politics, it involves media um, relations, it me uh, regulation, it involves culture and society. That's kind of where we are now. I could talk at length. <laughs> We, we will get the, the rest of the story from you over the course of the next uh, 30, 35, 40 minutes. Um, Graham, question for you about the Digital Forensic Lab. So I know that you have a partnership or have had a partnership with Facebook, um, and I wondered if you could kind of tell us a bit about that and about what you've learned or what you've uncovered uh, in the course of that partnership. Yeah, so it, we have a, our partnership with Facebook is is current, it's ongoing. Uh, they're at the other panel, uh, so you could ask them about it directly, but you'd have to leave, so don't do that. Uh, basically, what it has allowed us to do is grow the body of work that we were already doing independently. So right now, Facebook is doing a, a number of things internally and making a lot of policy decisions on content review and on what they do with newsfeed and all, all of these things, right? And they at least want to have a conversation about that or at least have an independent body of work that informs some of what they do. And so what we've done is we've taken some of that, um, it, some of those resources in order to do that and continued and grown what elections we're actually looking at. So for instance, we looked at German elections before, before our partnership was announced. Uh, we looked at Brazilian elections after our partnership was announced we looked at them in the exact same way that we had done before, but it allowed us to kind of look at more elections last year. Um, I think that it's, it's interesting in that a lot of the conversation that has gone on with our partnership has been around takedowns, whether or not you know, we should be taking down accounts or, or not. It, what I would say on our overall funding model is that if we were to take money only from Facebook, we would be very expensive advertising. That's 
totally honest. If we were to only take money from governments as a think tank, uh, we would be very, very high, high dollar uh, propaganda, essentially. And if we were to only take money from foundations, then we probably couldn't turn on the lights. Uh, so we've made a strategic decision because we see disinformation as a truly collective problem where every single one of those entities, including government, including the private sector, especially the private sector, uh, but also media and civil society, which is generally the side that we come out on, uh, all needs to be at the table. And so if we can use that investment in order to leverage that and bring them all to the table in a more clear and transparent way, right? If the trade-off is that we uh, do a lot of independent research, but we you know, get a lot of questions about what our partnership with Facebook looks like, if, if what we get in return is more action in a more transparent way, that's a trade-off that I will take all day. Yeah, and to be clear, my, my question was not a, uh, a veiled criticism of the relationship <laughs> at all. It's uh, You are in a unique position, um, I, I think, by having this relationship with Facebook and by being able to perhaps work with them um, and help develop their understanding of disinformation. And so I was uh, particularly kind of curious about the insights that you gain that you wouldn't necessarily have otherwise if you, you didn't have uh, a relationship or a partnership like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's one of these things where I think that uh, disinformation is, unless it's a truly bad actor, right? Dis the way that we define disinformation is the spread of false information with intent. So the intent part is important. Uh, and if you're a bad actor, then you have that intent. But in general, a lot of the folks that, uh, that are trying to create solutions around negative externalities, like Facebook or Twitter or the platforms, whoever, some governments, it's not like they woke up in the morning and were like, okay, how can we use this platform to spread a bunch of false information? That's on the side of the content creators. And so creating structures in order to deal with that, that's something that we all need to be kind of invested on. And I think that that goes back to the point that like, we need m better policy from governments. We need more action from the private sector. And frankly, we need better coverage and a better understanding to not give oxygen of amplification from media on this topic. And so if we can kind of use a 501c3 nonprofit that happens to be located in DC, but has staff in a lot of different places that is trying to do that, then we'll, we'll grow that work. So this brings me to um, what may be a bit of an odd question, but you are an excellent group of, of scholars and, and uh, experts and on these and associated issues. And so my question for you is, what in this space scares you the most? Is it Russian trolls? Is it, Rob, that the proposed solution um, you've suggested it involves a real serious political shakeup? Is it that we, um, you know, is it continuing threats of disinformation? Is it the, you know, a question about competition or monopolies? What scares you the most about where we are right now? Keeping in mind this is not unique to this time in this place, um, but that you are ones working on these issues right now. And feel free to jump in. <laughs> so the, the, the thing that scares me the most is there's not an obvious fix for it, one. And number two, I guess that should have been number two. Number one would be uh, <laughs> that the market of place of ideas is broken. It doesn't work as we hoped it would. Can you say a bit more about that? So in an ideal state, so the answer to bad speech, disinformation, misinformation is more speech, the idea that facts bubble up to the top. And in a deeply polarized political situation, that's just not the case. And that's depressing. You don't even need um, purposeful manipulation by the government. You don't need censorship. Uh, media systems can go awry based upon the activities of very smart, um, well-meaning, well-educated people. And, ah. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I guess I really struggle with, you know, the superlative, but a thing that is scary. Right, well, Ellery, make one of the worst. One, one of the scariest. worst. I mean, is the fact that the, the biggest the biggest and most accessible platforms that allow people to actually engage in speech are totally profit-driven. 
because I mean, this kind of thing, Facebook, yeah, is is working with a bunch of groups to evaluate disinformation on its platform, but it's like it's chasing its own tail. Like, you know, it also it, there's not nearly enough information in out in the public about what, the way Facebook engages with governments, but that's really connected to a lot of what happens here. So if on one hand you're going and helping a political party promote themselves on your platform and then you're like, oh wait, there's disinformation that seems to promote the interests of that party. It's like, okay. But, it, but, the, but, the, but the, the thing is what is most important to them is profit. So I think that's not gonna give us the marketplace of ideas that, that you know, you guys hoped for. I would be curious to hear either of your responses to that um, in terms of whether you agree and also whether any of you have thought about solutions or how we, how if at all, we, we try to move past that. I think that in general, disinformation is a problem that goes, that doesn't respect our kind of neatly defined borders or jurisdictions or, and I mean that from the government standpoint and the private sector standpoint, right? Like if you, if the government of the United States creates a perfectly crafted policy that addresses this domestically, unless it sets a global standard, then it's an incomplete solution. If Facebook drafts a perfectly crafted policy that changes the platform of Facebook, then you still have a number of other platforms and a, and a place where this will exist, it will find a place to exist. And you see that a little bit with uh, content transitioning from like accounts that were taken off of Twitter and then finding a, 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 a extremely highly engaged marketplace on Gab, right? And so figuring out where we can use leverage points across the globe in order to create truly global standards, whether that's with GDPR in Europe or whether that's with standards of speech in the United States, whether that's with tax law in uh, the UK, whether that's with like the emerging tech law in Brazil, right? And figuring out which jurisdictions we can leverage out in order to create truly global standards, that's tough. But going back to Rob's point, uh, the most uncomfortable part of this, because we have a strange dichotomy of terms that we use generally in this, in this field, right, right? Like foreign interference, disinformation, misinformation, they all mean slightly different things. Disinformation and foreign interference are, are drastically different what we have is a people problem. There's a market for this. And so until we, <laughs> until we admit that we have a problem, which I think that this room has generally agreed on, thank you for being here, uh, but the, a number of rooms outside of this place have not agreed on that. And until we have that agreement at scale or that just recognition, that self-recognition at scale, uh, we, haven't, we haven't even begun, so. That's what freaks me out the most. I used to work at the National Security Council, so I used to get asked, you know, what keeps you up at night? That's what keeps me up at night. <laughs> so. so I guess that raises the question then of um, how far we have come or have not come or have, have to go on these issues. I know each of you is working in this space uh, doing very, very different work. Um, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about whether it's thinking about uh, how Facebook and Twitter and other platforms have uh, approached these issues or whether it's how policymakers have responded uh, or threatened to respond. Um, I, I'd certainly like to hear more about your thoughts about um, where, we, where we go from here or uh, how successful we've been so far. Short answer, not successful <laughs> so far. Um, no, I think that you need to burn the candle at both ends, which is to say you need to have both a, a, a better, wider understanding uh, from a general populace of, you know, what, like, typical consumer, what governments would call citizens and what companies would call customers and what you and I would basically call our, like, friends and family. Uh, you need to have a better understanding from, from that group. But you also need to have structural policy solutions from companies and from governments that make sense and understand each other, which the information gap between all those groups, government, media, and tech is still, I mean, based on, I assume that this group has watched all of the congressional testimony, the questions are not great. So until those questions <laughs> get better, the answers aren't gonna get any better and the policies are certainly not gonna get better. And so those are, you have to come at it from both of those sides, the grassroots and the grass tops. And until we do that, uh, we're only, again, just beginning. 
Ellery, you, uh, <laughs> your face saying a lot right now. <laughs> Please always, tell us. <laughs> always the truth, not always my best interest. Um, well, I guess I'm wondering what kind of policy solutions you're thinking about. Because one of the things that we've been following closely is the number of proposed laws intended to criminalize or otherwise regulate fake news, false information, disinformation. Um, in the past year, France, Brazil, Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia, all have stuff either are now on the books or in the works. A lot of countries in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East, North Africa already have laws addressing the, you know, making false information illegal, and those are used in a variety of ways, including, you know, to impose political censorship. So that scares us a lot. Um, I, and I'm kind of curious, I'm curious to know what you're thinking about, because there's probably lots of things, and that's just, I'm like, no, no, you know, but. What's the solution? I think that, so, <laughs> so I'm not, I mean, I would say in terms of like specific, I don't have like a white paper that I'm going to pass out afterwards and be like, hey, we should do this at U.S. Congress, and they should do this in Brazil, and they should do this in Germany, or what, mm -hmm. but, but at the same time, the information gap in all those places is pretty apparent between all of these vested groups that have an interest in this. And to give an example that is uh, like high level and not particularly nuanced, GDPR, the right to be forgotten, mm -hmm. was written generally by countries that are not a threat to their own people. So if, if the right to be forgotten is going to be a global standard that applies to the global south as well, where there are a number of countries where the government is actually a threat to its own people, then the right to be forgotten is going to mean something totally different. And that level of awareness is just not out there, including within this high level group of policymakers. And so, I mean, better understanding is an amorphous and not particularly cathartic uh, or concrete thing to say, okay, well, we, this is something that we need to do. It's pretty much something that we can all agree on. At the same time, it's a lot harder to do than we've all kind of, uh, than I think we've admitted so far. Does that kind of? <laughs> uh, so, so totally agree we shouldn't be uh, regulating truth telling. That would be a really bad, bad idea and would backfire in so many ways. So let, let us not do that. Um, I think there's um, a behavioral piece that I think we're starting to take on. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not really too Pollyannish about this, but um, we, we need to recognize in ourselves that we're really bad at distinguishing truth from lies mm -hmm. and that we need help in doing so and we need humility. So that's number one. And then the other thing is we need to reinvest, uh, appropriate to say this in the museum, we need to reinvest in journalism, particularly local journalism, where the feedback loops are very, very tight so that people can read reporting from people on the ground in their communities and know whether it's right or not and become informed about the world. Ultimately, we are, our understanding of the world, our our absorption of knowledge is a social phenomenon, and we need to take care of the social institutions that create knowledge for us and hold them to account. A little abstract, but <laughs> <laughs> no. it's not a filter on, on Facebook. Yeah. yeah. Um, so before I turn this over to the audience for questions, I do have one final question for you. Building off of that, um, you know, we, we've just kind of heard a couple of ideas about how we might uh, begin to address this, uh, in, you know, everything from congressional intervention possibly to, uh, you know, funding or, or building up local journalism. Another one of the refrains that I, I certainly have heard a lot has been about uh, digital literacy or digital literacy education. Um, I'd be curious if that's something that, that you guys are, are thinking about or engaging in or think is an effective path forward. Um, and I ask this particularly in light of, of the recent research that has shown um, that some of the uh, kind of biggest perpetrators of, of sharing uh, or dissemination of disinformation are actually uh, folks in older age groups um, rather than those who might be uh, kind of at a, an, a you know, grade school, middle school, even high school level and be getting regular kind of civics and digital literacy lessons. So I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Uh, Got to be done. I think it's going to 
chip away at things a little bit. It's not a sol silver bullet. Um, there's a lot of interesting research and work to be done in helping people to become um, better critical thinkers. Uh, one of the leading theories of um, why people are duped by fake news is that they're not critical enough in their reading. There's uh, something the, uh, the academics call, called cognitive reflection, which is, are you just taking it on its merits, or are you trying to engage with it and look for clues that people might be trying to snow you or not? Mm -hmm. A typical question on cognitive reflection tests are, um, if you're running a race and you've just passed the person in second place, what place are you in? If you answer first place, you're more likely to f share fake news online. Um, I won't ask for a poll. <laughs> <laughs> you notice how I gave nobody zero time yeah. to reflect on the question at all. Um, uh, but perhaps there's a little bit of, of headway to be made there. Uh, it's not going to solve the problem. We need structures. We need institutions to help us. And we need to reinvest in professional societies and objective journalism and education and all those kinds of things. I, I have something that I'm inspired by that I'll just do like a little plug for that you should all check out if you're at all interested in what's happening in Syria. Um, a colleague of mine who works with a really small group of about six technologists and researchers, they run this project called the Syrian Archive. And the Syrian Archive is a pretty impressive database of mostly video and some images um, from the war that this group has gone to extensive lengths to, to really like to verify and code and categorize and archive in such a way that it can be searched in all different kind of ways in detail, but also they're taking serious measures to preserve it um, with the thought idea that it will probably be useful as war crimes evidence in the future. Um, and the thing that, and this is, I mean, they have had to deal with a tremendous amount of shit with YouTube because YouTube routinely takes down videos that are evidence of um, uh, war crimes and human rights violations. And there's, there's a disinformation threat and all that, of course. But I think one of the thing that inspires me so much about the Syrian archive is when you start to look around in there, you're like, oh, internet stuff can be like this too. Like it's a very didactic kind of platform, to me at least. I mean, you need to understand some stuff to move around in it and to find information. But that type of project that gives you a new way to think about how information is organized and how it's verified, and really you learn about verification just as you're looking at the content, is so powerful and, and important right now. And so I'm, I'm sort of interested in trying to promote those types of projects that, yeah, it's one, you know, it's one issue, it's one specific place, but that's like, that's the beauty of the internet, you know? And so re really giving more kind of oxygen and energy to those kinds of, of that kind of work, I think is, is super important. First, definitely support Syrian Archive. We feed into it, we give data to it. It's one of the best open source archives out there <laughs> and it will literally be used in The Hague to produce evidence of war crimes. Um, you doing things like, you know, Twitter posts and YouTube videos. Uh, so it's useful, social media is useful. Um, on the digital literacy piece, I think yes and. Uh, digital literacy, media literacy are these terms that are kind of thrown around in policy circles that are amorphous and can be any number of things. So kind of better defining exactly what that actually means for us in terms of building out a bunch of things that would lead to digital resilience. I think media literacy, absolutely, like teaching people how to better consume media or news. Uh, digital literacy, uh, making sure that people better understand what platforms actually do, and uh, frankly, creating policies around the fact that like Twitter is designed to do something different than Facebook is designed to do, right? Facebook is to allow me to better connect with my friends from Colorado, and Twitter is to uh, designed for me to you know shout into the ether about news. Um, and there's a difference there, so digital literacy. I think basic cyber hygiene, uh, which is a term that our speechwriters used to really, really hate, uh, but it's useful. It, understanding that you have vulnerabilities online, if you're, you know, if you're posting things on Facebook or if you have online banking, just understanding like what your data footprint is online, and then frankly, civics. 
just how to be a good and productive citizen in a society. Uh, and all of those things kind of feed into this concept of, okay, yeah, we need digital literacy today to be a good citizen, but if we're going to actually create policies to better democracy or to promote objective fact in democracy, then it's going to have to incorporate all of those things at some point or in some shape or form. So yes and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, on that note, we've got about uh, 10 to 12 minutes, so I want to turn it over to the audience for your, uh, your questions. So we'll do one, two, three, four, five, six, and that's probably all we can do. Thanks a lot. Uh, all right, well, we'll see if we can get you in. It's <laughs> working. Um, great, thank you very much. Um, Zviad Zimbaya, I have a background of starting here in the United States and working in the Euro European Parliament on disinformation and Stratcom. Uh, so my question is, um, disinformation, I find disinformation much more successful in the short run versus democracy. Um, how do we, what do we do tomorrow? So we, we talked about um, media literacy, uh, digital literacy uh, and everything, which is great. But tomorrow, it, that information, false information has penetrated much more then, for instance, the brilliant analysis that Graham and uh, other organizations do in terms of reaching out to rank and file in the remote areas. Uh, so how do we deal with that? And second piece, when it comes to um, understanding or believing fake news by, by, by people globally, uh, it also has to do with some of the cognitive biases that, has, that is not the power of, uh, of the, the, the author of uh, this information about our weakness. So how, what's, what's the piece there that what can be done in terms of enhancing our own power versus this, this information? Thank you. Anybody want to jump in? I'll jump in on the first because I'll be quick. Uh, thank you. And it's typically not me, it's the DFR lab and a, frankly a much larger network of what we would call digital Sherlock's, which is pithy branding, but you're not likely to forget it. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I mean, it, and growing that work, right? You're from Eastern Europe and frankly, after the, uh, after the 2016 elections, which going back to Ellery's point, when, when this conversation was percolating, percolating in the United States, you'd go over to places in Europe and they'd be like, Thank God you're here. Welcome to the conversation, finally, right? We've been dealing with this for decades and decades and decades. And so uh, going back to your point, I think it raising the exposure of disinformation itself is really important, but it's not a solution in and of itself. But we need to do the first thing first, which is expose it. Other and expose like where it comes from. I mean, which is, I think it in interestingly sometimes gets decoupled from its sort of original source. There's a lot of hysteria about a rumor, but who, who paid for this? It's like, yeah. Hi, Steve Del Bianco with NetChoice. Rob, your primal fear was that the marketplace of ideas is broken. So the question for all of you is, do you recall a, play, a time in our history where the marketplace idea actually did work? where broad spectrums of uh, socioeconomic and geographically dispersed individuals could freely exchange news and views on a topic of importance in a way that the marketplace idea actually worked. Because I'm afraid you're imagining something that never existed and holding a standard we cannot reach. Uh, so that, that, that's a great point. I mean, we shouldn't idealize the past or hope for things that aren't possible. But there, there was a point in time which media critics were very wary of at the time where we had a few major broadcasters that pretty much told the same news. And in the United States, at least, there was a commonality in how people understood the facts of the world at the time. And what we have now, so we have a much richer media ecosystem in many ways. We have, um, in many ways, a lot more reporting, a lot more voices. But what we've lost is we've lost that um, those trusted sources of yep. authority. But, but Rob, you said a marketplace of ideas where people would debate solutions. So don't talk about what the news is, but how do we solve problems? And that's where, that's when you answer the question. You said there's not a place for people to debate the right solutions, as opposed to hearing Walter Cronkite say that's the way it is. 
Well, people were still able to debate within their communities, at work, within the church, wherever, people could debate. They weren't debating um, at a national level in the same way. So we've lost something and gained something. So we now have the ability and the affordances to debate things across the world. Uh, but what we've lost is we've lost that commonality of understanding of the world. So uh, I'm not idealizing the past in that thing, but it would be nice to have um, agreed upon um, facts about how the world is now that we could then debate upon. I might, I might be able to add something positive to reconcile this. <laughs> um, thank you for your panel. Will you uh, introduce Oh, yourself? sorry, I'm Lorelai Kelly. I'm at Georgetown. Um, I studied behavioral economics in school, and the, the piece of it that I am reminded of daily now is loss aversion, which is the tendency of humans to trade off the future to maintain the present, basically. And our problem is that in the sort of free market of data and technology, that loss aversion has not just been weaponized, it's been um, monetized. So there's a market for scaling conspiracy <laughs> that the public good, public sector accountable institutions can't even come up with. And my question is why can't we just repurpose the public serving institutions that we have to be this sort of trust engine for democracy? Um, I work with Congress and um, every single member of Congress I work with is trying something at home to build this new deliberative space where they are the interlocutor, they are the information intermediary themselves or their office could be that. And uh, there's, there's a real need for this because it can also become the sort of auditable supply chain of information into policy as Congress becomes more machine readable. You know, the Open Government Act was just signed a couple weeks ago. Congress now has this special select committee on modernization. So that we have the parts for creating um, a curated marketplace of ideas, and the members of Congress themselves um, can be that curation function. Like, everybody loves all this information. The, what's missing is a, is a curation, it's a vetting. Um, so I, I would just argue that there's the parts in place for this now, um, and journalism is a huge piece of it. But that we have to, it's not an equal playing field. The government is supposed to be the trust engine for democracy. It's not, and it's not for lots of reasons, but it should be, it should be fighting full on um, to take on the, the monetization and the weaponization of information for democracy. Is there, do you have a particular question? And I'm just or asking just, for the, okay. in the behavioral science, I mean, um, what do you think could be this if it's not our government? The private sector is not gonna do this for us. Can I just add, so one of the structural things that creates this, I think, at scale, which is to say the marketplace of ideas is broken, is the, there is no social cost to lying uh, online, frankly. There's no social cost, and I'm not saying that we should criminalize lying online. Like, government is not good at that. At the same time, in the kind of version, not in antiquity, but in a past day, where there is a social cost of, you know, the community of your church or the community around your kitchen table or whatever. There's a social cost to, to lying or to being continuously inaccurate. And if you can get on, you know, a platform and say things in an anonymous way and just pot shot at people that are across the country or across the world, then it lessens that social cost. And so there is no kind of sense of cohesion and it's exacerbated, it's maybe not because of that, but it's a, a absolutely accelerated or exacerbated by that kind of level of, in some cases, anonymity, and in other cases, lack of cost to that behavior specifically. So. Larry, Rob, quick responses? Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I love the idea of our elected officials being the source of truth and accuracy in the world. Um, we need more than that. I don't think we can count on them to always be that. Uh, I, I, my vote would be librarians. I, they're across the United States, and <laughs> <laughs> their their job is to, to <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I, it's going to be a, a number of things, and and we need to build systems that interlock with one another and hold checks and balances. The the, the key to this is that to have systems in place, which not only work great when they work great, but um, when they fail, they are self-correcting as well. 
I would also vote for libraries and for Wikipedia. And I, I just, I think that scale and the idea that we have to have something that is where everyone goes just might not be right. All right, we've got three minutes for two or three questions, so keep them as succinct as possible. Um, the woman in the second row. Yes, just following on from what you are talking about, it, is there any efforts that look promising to you for a common language, common definitions? What is a media organization? Are you journalism? What are the reporter? What is a citizen journalist? Are, what is Facebook doing to be um, uh, more, are they contributing to building that kind of common lexicon, common understanding? That, that along those lines. Short answer, invest in DFR Lab and Global Voices. Uh, and we'll do that. And 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 BKC. <laughs> And CDT while you're at it. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, frankly, like Facebook could be a market mover on that specifically. If they just said, listen, these are the definitions that we use, then, then they would be the definitions that would create global standards. At the same time, uh, you, you might not want that. And it's, uh, they, I, I use that as an engagement platform because it's a, it's a safe conversation to have. Okay, like we're going to have a conversation about definitions. Uh, we just need a common understanding and move forward using definitions. I, 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 I'm kind of, I don't know, I, I have fatigue on the definitions conversation. Yeah, I think, I think um, something that resonates well in a lot of different parts of the world is the idea, although you need to translate it depending, it's uh, the idea of the public interest and of doing reporting or, you know, putting information out there in the public interest and there's, I know that there's can be plenty of subjectivity around that, but that's really resonated a lot. So I find I find that more talking about the action to be much more useful than talking about the role of the journalist. Yeah, yeah I, I would I would lean into more um, to standards than definitions. I think the within good media organizations and within journalism mm -hmm. schools, they are schooled on objectivity and fact checking, and I think that that's as probably as good as we can do. Yeah, it's hard to know who's going to be the arbiter of who is reputable and not. And this is a problem with online spaces and labels and those kinds of things. It's it's very difficult. and. Hopefully the Ellery <laughs> Award figured out. But <laughs> but we, <laughs> we could have a much, much larger all, conversation about this. All I was going to say this. was that it, I think that also, and this is something that we try to do more and more, is to be really forward about what our standards are and say, if you're curious, here you can read all of our, you know, our guidelines and procedures and our editorial code. That kind of ac extra gesture to kind of just put it in front of a reader instead of expecting them to go find it, I think is really important. We are already yeah. over. Look, Sorry, I'll go just ahead, bro. add one more thing. And again, look, look what happens when it fails. So, good, strong organizations are, are accountable to themselves, yeah. and they fix themselves when they fail because everybody fails. I just want to say that. Sorry. Perfect. It's one other <laughs> and it's a good. It's a good note to end on. Um, so uh, I know there were a couple of other questions. I'm sorry, we're not going to get to them because you've got about four minutes to grab coffee and a snack before um, the the final round of keynotes or sessions. I'm not sure what's right after this. But um, thank you to the audience for coming to State of Net and for coming to this panel. And thank you to the panelists. This was really interesting.